Thank you so much, Valerie. Thank you, Louise. Thank everybody at the Women's Center of the New York Historical Society and to my friend Gloria Steinem for recommending me to speak to you. Thank you, Representative Maloney, for your inspiring talks and special thanks. Thank you. They're accommodating my age. <laughs> Uh, and special thanks to my daughter Elizabeth for accompanying me despite her daunting jet lag. Uh, and I should also mention, since her organization has been, has been praised so far that several times, that she is now president of the Mellon Foundation, which has in part funded these, this conference. Um, to the rest of you old and new friends, Thanks for rising so early on Sunday morning to celebrate the first day of Women's History Month. And I'm glad it's the first because it's right on the cusp of Black History Month, which represents the juncture where my work always seems to take me. It's impossible to separate the struggles for women's political, legal, and social empowerment from the centuries-long African-American civil rights movement. In recent years, we should also include in these efforts the work that has gone into acquiring and guaranteeing access to inequality for the physically and mentally challenged and members of the LBGTQ communities as well. And I can't help but think that the ongoing efforts to thwart women's reproductive rights are closely related to these other quests. I applaud all of these efforts which seek to acquire and maintain an equal footing for the broadest possible segments of our country in the face of ingrained and always daunting assumptions about the inevitability and appropriateness of white male supremacy. That's part of the big picture about the struggle, and it's a still unresolved struggle, which is critically important, but I also believe that individual stories are important too. They allow us to personalize those struggles and make them and their participants accessible and relatable. I've been a teacher and writer for years, but consider myself primarily a storyteller, and storytelling is an art form that's as old as time and as old as families have come together to share common experiences and pass them down to future generations to savor and to save. So let me start with a brief account of my family memoir, Princess of the Hither Isles, what it's about and how, over time, it came to and evolved from questions from that point into an amorphous idea and ultimately into a book. Of course, 1980 isn't where it ultimately began. It began for me in childhood and even before that year, 1980. Uh, an African-American scholar whom I knew slightly telephoned and came by my home because she wanted to talk to me about my grandmother, Adela Hunt Logan. Adela, she told me, would be an integral part of her upcoming doctoral dissertation. I knew that Adela had been a suffragist in, the Jim, Crow, in Jim Crow, Alabama, and that she'd worked, though unsuccessfully, during her own lifetime. She'd worked to get women the right to vote. I'd heard parts, but not all of the story from members of my family as I was growing up. The importance of voting was deeply ingrained in me during my childhood. I remember spirited family debates among and between Adela's daughters. Those were my paternal aunts, among whom I grew up. The oldest had been born in 1892, and like many of her generation, she always remained loyal to what was then the party of Lincoln while her two younger sisters reached their political maturity in the early Roosevelt era, and they became dyed-in-the-wool Democrats. I also retain an ineradicable muscle memory of going through the catacombs of my local public library across the street from our apartment building, reaching up to hold my mother's hand, and hearing the swish click and snap as she closed the fabric privacy curtain around her. That was well before I turned four years old. But the political impulses of the women in my family didn't start there. My paternal grandmother, Adela, the suffragist, was the person for whom I was named in 
which always gave me an irremovable link to her. Also, and even now, her portrait hangs on the front wall in my hallway. After hearing a good deal more from that long ago visitor about Adela than I'd previously known, and after reading the feminist tracts about voting, which she shared with me that Adela had written, I had at least one nagging question. In a place, the Deep South, and at a time, the post-Reconstruction years and the height of Jim Crow, when virtually everyone around her must have believed and reinforced the message that she was neither eligible for nor worthy of the vote, both because she wasn't male and also because she wasn't white. So why did Adela so passionately and so hopelessly advocate gaining the right for all women to be enfranchised? I'm not sure even now if I understand precisely what motivated her, but those questions haunted me and I began writing about my grandmother who died long before I was born. In 1983, Ms. Magazine published an article I submitted about finding my paternal grandmother. At that time, the, the editors wrote this about me. Adele Logan Alexander is working on a book-length biography of Adela Hunt Logan. Well, it's been a very long journey and taken lots of detours before I finish that book-length biography, which, in fact, involved into my new family memoir. Princess of the Hither Isles. Over the years, I shuttled back and forth with its creation, moving from standard history to fiction, alternately as a no novel told by an anonymous voice and then by Adela herself. Finally, I settled on a memoir as the most viable format for my work. To write this memoir, I've culled stories from the depth of memory and quoted and abridged Adela's words and those of many others. I've imagined a number of conversations and incidents, but reading reams of primary and secondary sources, conducting interviews, making el endless trips to archives, old family homes, schools, and churches. Have, ho have been shaped by the historian's skill. All of this, of course, has resulted in lots of worn shoe leather. Those were my methods and my modus operandum. For years, I continued pursuing that intriguing political activist, that little-known, outspoken black woman who looked white, for whom I am named. But hold on. Here I've introduced another major factor into the mix. A black woman who looked white, I just said. How does that complicate the story? I don't have enough time fully to explore that element in depth just now, but let me say simply that it reinforces the fact that race, as it has been defined in the United States, has always been far more a legal, cultural, and social construction than a physical or genetic reality. And that artificial and misleading construction was erected in our country's early years by the founders, and it has been maintained by their descendants for the purpose, albeit a complex and changing purpose, of establishing and maintaining the legacy, hegemony, and power of a literate, propertied, white male power elite. In most of the world, this has not been the case, but here it's been the rule and not the exception that a so-called drop of colored blood, or 1 16th, 1 8th, 1 quarter in different states, that that drop of colored blood, which indeed is in and of itself an absurdity, that has relegated the bearers of that so-called stain to a lower status and often guaranteed that they suffer enduring disadvantages of all sorts. Adela's physical legacy came about because all of her male ancestors were white. Her female antecedents, on the other hand, were African, African American, or Cherokee, and those familial relationships are intriguing in and of themselves. As an addendum to those racial prescriptions, it was not until 1967 that the United States Supreme Court, in the case of Loving versus Virginia, determined that interracial marriages no longer could be forbidden or criminalized any place in the country. And specifically as to Adela Hunt Logan, because of her mixed race ancestry, she looked like a white woman. But that was not what she considered herself. 
The female members of her family in her own and earlier generations had been among the Deep South's very few anomalous so-called free people of color. I say anomalous because their freedom was always limited by both law and practice. Nonetheless, they definitely were not enslaved as were most African Americans in their region. Adela was born in rural Georgia during the Civil War, at which time her father was a slaveholding Confederate officer. Despite legal restrictions in that state that banned interracial marriages, he was, I believe, officially married. The ceremony was performed by a family member who was a state judge. He was officially married to Adela's mother. Adela grew up in relative economic comfort and security. She earned a college and later a master's degree from Atlanta University. And by so doing, she became one of the South's most highly educated women of any racial or economic background. And as might be expected, having really no other options and because she wanted to serve her people, she became a teacher. Her educational achievements notwithstanding, law and practice combined with her own strong sense of self-identity made Adela a colored woman. But she wouldn't be cowed and didn't always play by the rules that had been determined for her, both by that legally determined Negro identity and by the laws that enforced and enforced practices that were supposed to pertain to her sex as well. The white male elected and appointed officials of Tuskegee, Alabama, required the colored residents of Booker T. Washington's famous Tuskegee Institute, where Adela taught, lived, and raised her children from the 1880s through 1915, to travel in and out of their town via a designated back road. But Adela refused to do so and boldly drove her buggy down the main thoroughfare. Authorities also demanded that the Institute's Residents adhere to Alabama's prevalent Jim Crow requirements, which reinforced the demeaning reality that all colored people must use back doors, <coughs> drink from segregated water fountains, uh, <coughs> um, use filthy toilets, inferior means of transportation, and other public facilities. But Adela refused to do any of that. And because she looked and frankly acted white, citizens of the town of Tuskegee were often at a loss as to what to do with and about her and her egregious misbehavior. That societal misbehavior spilled over into her activities in the women's suffrage movement. She attended segregated suffrage conferences in the Jim Crow South by masquerading as a white woman the suffrage movement's leaders, a number of whom held racist beliefs themselves, didn't know what to do with her. So in most cases, they reluctantly played along with her charade. Adela's goal in attending those sessions in the 1890s and early 1900s was to meet with the movement's power brokers, learn more about the impact of women's disenfranchisement, try to gain support for the efforts of African-American women such as herself, and especially to bring back to her own community the information she gleaned and the materials she collected in segregated venues, and in turn, to educate her colleagues. Perhaps you're shaking your heads and saying what a fruitless masquerade to pass for white and but thus betray her race. But I think not. Even beyond the classroom, she did help to educate her people, especially African American women, about all sorts of political issues and especially about the import of suffrage. She did write with great passion and sharp intellect about the injustices of black, that black women endured because of their political and disempowerment, and always about the import of voting for women of her race. She wrote these treaties in words that resonate even today. Let me read from several of Adela's essays that, de that date back more than a century. We should heed President Lincoln's words, one began. Government of the people, by the people, and for the people. But those requisites are only partially realized if women have no vote. If we are citizens, why not treat us as such on questions of law and governance, where women are now classed as minors and idiots, 
If white women, if white Americans with all of their advantages need the ballot, and they do, if it has helped them as it has, how much more do Negroes, male and female, need the defense of the vote to help us secure and maintain our rights? She continued, the main components of personal sovereignty are wisdom and power, and the greatest power any people in a democracy have is that which they exercise at the polls. At present, few women, especially colored women, can claim that vital indicator of civic empowerment. This writer, however, knows many of her own sex, a number of them, Negroes such as I, who are prepared to assume the responsibilities and rights of full citizenship. Those rights include casting our ballots, even perhaps voting for other women and running for office ourselves. A few years later, she wrote an article titled Colored Women as Voters for W.E.B. Du Bois's and the NAACP's renowned journal, The Crisis, in which she said this, every day, increasing numbers of colored women study civics, but they are convinced that their efforts would be more telling if they had the vote. The fashion of saying, I do not care to meddle with politics, is disappearing among these women because politics meddles constantly with them. More and more colored women are participating in civic activities, and women who believe that they need the vote also believe that the vote needs them. We should reread our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. This much is certain. Negroes believe in equal justice regardless of race, color, creed, class, or sex. And they eagerly await the day when the United States truly shall have a government of the people, for the people, and by the people, including its colored women. Through other writings and community meetings, she further urged the black women who lived in and near Tuskegee to petition their local boards of health, state representatives, even United States congressmen and senators for essential constituent services. Such recommendations, however, were considered incendiary. She and others worried that she might only be exhorting the South's neediest, most vulnerable, and often illiterate citizens, if they honestly could claim any citizenship rights at all, to tilt blindly at windmills. So after hearing some of Adela Hunt Logan's words today, I expect that you will agree that she was one bad sister. Um, she was a troublemaker extraordinaire. But you also may understand why I thought it was important to tell her story to make it known to others. I also want to talk a bit about my upcoming work, because it builds on these efforts. If Adela's mission was the political empowerment of women, her daughters also sought empowerment through education and to maintain control over their bodies. I'm preparing to write about these women of that generation in my family. Their mother, my paternal grandmother, Adela Hunt Logan, bore at least nine children, three of them after the age of 40, and the last two following a nephrectomy or kidney removal. I hardly think it's mere happenstance that although all three of them married, none had children of their own. That, I am certain, was a deliberate choice on their part. One daughter became a teacher. Another worked to improve the lot of African-American nurses who were segregated and discriminated against due to their race and forced to work for menial wages. She also chaired the director's board of a home for unwed mothers. That may seem an anachronism today, but it was a vital innovative service in the 1930s and 40s when such single mothers were viewed and treated as immoral and shamed outcasts. The third and youngest sister, Myra Logan, became a renowned surgeon who is now acclaimed as the first woman in the world to perform open heart surgery. But one of her most important endeavors was running a birth control clinic in Harlem, where she told a friend and mentor she would perform 20 or 30 pelvic examinations at each meeting for virtually no pay. I clearly remember from listening to their conversations during my childhood that not only was voting, as per their mother's mission, of vital importance to my aunts as an indicator of personal empowerment, but reproductive choice was as well. 
Much as Adela did not live long enough to vote following the ratification of the 19th Amendment, none of her daughters lived to appreciate the critical Roe v. Wade decision, which supposedly guaranteed women's reproductive rights. Nor did they endure the court challenges, widespread shaming, threats, and street demonstrations that have ensued thereafter with the goal of, once again, limiting women's rights and control over their bodies. But there's little question that Adela's example impacted her daughters in the context of their profound civic involvement. And the import of votes for women still resonates today in my family and elsewhere. So let's consider the timeline of voting rights in the United States, starting with ratification of the 15th Amendment in 1870. Although major debates and controversies surrounded its passage, that wasn't really a difficult decision for the white male Republican po politicians to decide on and support. They knew that to the extent that they voted at all after they were, vo were allowed to cast their ballots in 18 1870, the vast majority of such black men would continue to support this party of Lincoln. But the 15th Amendment did not specify that property holding could not be a prerequisite for voting, nor did it provide that naturalized citizens could be excluded from the, from the franchise, and certainly it did not include women. 17 is sticking. Uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, new literacy tests, property and residency requirements, poll taxes, morality and grandfather clauses, white primaries and the like, specifically targeted the voting rights of black men throughout the American South. Physical and economic intimidation of those who tried to vote became the rule rather than the exception. All such nefarious endeavors reinforced the maintenance of white men as the country's key power brokers. And of course, in the decades following the 1920 ratification of the 19th Amendment, even though women were allowed, if not encouraged, to vote, the restrictions against all black voters still negatively impacted the civil, civic rights of African American women as much as they did men in the American South. It was not until 1965 that an energized and determined civil rights movement, mostly populated by young, younger African Americans, facilitated by the political leadership and dedication of President Lyndon Baines Johnson, it was not until then that the Critical Voting Rights Act allowed for the enfranchisement of black women throughout the South. The following year, 1966, saw the election of the first of those women to elective office. One of the first two African American women elected to Southern legislatures was the incredible orator Barbara Jordan, who became both famous and iconic. Jordan was elected to the Texas legislature in 1966. But the other woman is very little known and forgotten nowadays. Her name was Grace Towns Hamilton. And she was my mother's and Myra Logan's, Myra Logan being Adela's daughter. She was their best friend from Atlanta University and remained so thereafter. That was the same school where Myra's mother previously had gone to school. Grace, a civil rights activist for her entire adult life, was elected to represent the same geographical Atlanta district that in recent years has been held by a woman named Stacey Abrams, who is one of the most dynamic leaders to come out of the South since Barbara Jordan. Even now, conflicting political efforts surround the right and the abilities for minorities to exercise the franchise. On the one hand are those who argue that cheats will sully the vote by casting multiple ballots or by voting in incorrect polling places. They say that failing to radically cull voter rolls will allow anyone to cast a ballot in the name of a deceased person. Illegal aliens and felons, these protagonists further argue, might corrupt the outcomes of elections. College students might vote twice at the universities and at home. All reliable analyses, however, show that these bizarrely conceived conspiracy, conspiracy theories have virtually no statistical basis in truth. Even more serious 
are those who feel compelled to drastically cull voters from voting rolls. They also try to intimidate potential voters by threatening legal or economic retribution, or they try to limit early voting. They cut down on polling facilities. They purge thousands of voters by imposing exact match requirements, such as denying the vote to someone who has misspelled a street name, omitted a hyphen, or deleted or added a middle initial on any voting form. In some jurisdictions, such minor blips can result in one's either giving up altogether or having to cast a contested ballot which may not be included in the total vote tally at all. So today we have a somewhat different, cons somewhat different situation from that which Adela Hunt Logan faced in the early 1900s when she protested the exclusion of women from the franchise as well as the egregious restrictions of voting by black male southerners. But that was the ambiance in which Adela penned her early treatise about the importance of vote to a democracy, especially the importance of black women, whom she wanted to have included in the body politic. In recent years, in many southern ge jurisdictions, it's been the extraordinary turnout of black women voters that has decided elections. These women, though sometimes not entirely happy with their choices, have carpooled, babysat for one another, canvas trudged from door to door, watched polls, prayed, and fried chicken, and registered new voters. They understand, as Adela had, the importance of exercising the franchise. I think of them in the context of what Adela Hunt Logan advocated more than a century ago, and I know she would have been disturbed by the ongoing efforts at voter suppression that we still see today but also pleased and proud of what women such as that were and are doing to contribute to the integrity of the electoral process. So now, in 2020, we're celebrating the centennial of ratification of the 19th Amendment, as we should. But we must also think about the fact that voting rights for women came about in the context of enduring restrictions that both preceded and succeeded its enactment. Those restrictions followed in the wake of the ratification of the 15th Amendment, half a century before the approval of the Voting Rights Amendment. Yes, it was 50 years from 1870 to 1920. That's how long it took to get an amendment that purportedly guaranteed that sex could no longer be used, imposed as an impediment against women voting. In recent years, in recent decades, and even today, many people have argued that it is unnecessary, frivolous, or duplicative, but certainly it's worth pointing out that the United States, technically, it's, as you know, the, the legislatures of three quarters of the individual states, the United States has still failed to ratify an equal rights amendment, as Representative Maloney told us. That amendment, presumably would invalidate any remaining discriminatory provisions that still restrict women's rights any place in the country. But as to black women specifically, arguably it was not until passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that black women got enforceable assurances that they would have the right to vote. And if I may go back to what I said a few moments ago, what we may wonder, are we to think of the renewed and ongoing efforts that we see even now to limit, not to increase, access to the franchise, and also to limit women's rights to reproductive freedom. This story clearly is not finished. The ephemeral, idealistic promise of African American women's political empowerment inspired Adela Hunt Logan, and it has continued as a reality in the lives of our country's next generations of such women. Reproductive choice also as a means of establishing women's physical and economic empowerment further inspired her daughters in their work. May the fruits of all their labors continue to inspire us and demand to exert our rights, certainly they still inspire me. Thank you very much.